just just talk amongst yourselves for a moment. Make my way up here. Christians Thank United you, for Israel is the largest, Watch most this. influential pro-Israel grassroots organization in America. Since 2006, we have grown to over 3.5 million members and actively advocate for Israel in all 50 states. We strive to act as a defensive shield against anti-Israel lies, boycotts, bad theology, and political threats that seek to delegitimize Israel's existence and weaken the close relationship between Israel and the United States. Kufi On Campus is the largest pro-Israel student organization in America. We have developed an army of biblically and politically savvy Christian student leaders who advocate for Israel on campus nationwide. 2017 will mark the 400th campus impacted by a Kufi On Campus trained activist. The Israel Collective provides millennial Christian leaders with opportunities to connect with the land, history, and people of Israel. Israel Collective initiatives are changing the way millions of young adults see Israel. This year, Christians United for Israel launched the Mizrahi Project, an ongoing effort to tell the forgotten stories of 850,000 Jewish refugees forced to flee their ancestral homes in the Middle East and North Africa. At the start of 2016, we launched The Watchman on TBN, hosted by Eric Stackelbeck. The Watchman spotlights the rising security threats facing America and Israel, showcases the miraculous stories of how Israel is a light unto the nations, and highlights the work Kufi does to make Israel stronger and her people safer every day. The Watchman is available to over 100 million homes across the United States every week and has now become one of TBN's most popular Friday night primetime shows. With the help of our generous donors, Kufi has brought 699 pastors to Israel on 25 trips. Kufi holds multiple grassroots pro-Israel advocacy events nearly every week of the year. Our social media audience has grown to over 1.6 million people. Every single day, Kufi makes Israel stronger and her people safer. The diversity outreach team is growing Kufi's support in a wide range of ethnic communities across the United States. Love for Israel unites believers of every color and culture. Our Israel Trip alumni pastors have helped lead the fight against BDS in their states. Grassroots Kufi activists ensured that anti-BDS legislation became law in Texas and Nevada in 2017. In the last year, Kufi applied its full political power to defend Israel at the local, state, national, and international level. We mobilized tens of thousands of Christians to speak out against attacks on Israel at the United Nations. We helped the U.S. ambassador to Israel win his Senate confirmation battle. We spoke out for Israel with a unified voice, and our leaders listened. The next generation of Christian leaders are empowered with the biblical knowledge and political expertise to ensure the good work begun by Pastor Hagee and the founding members of Kufi continues for many decades to come. The breadth of our diversity across generational, racial, cultural, and denominational lines gives us a tremendous depth of influence and power in our fight to make Israel stronger and her people safer. Good morning, church. Thank you, worship team, filling our cups. Oh, can't he and won't he do it? I got saved this morning. I get saved every morning. I better. I better. I need it. I wake up. I need his mercies new every morning. I do. Maybe it's just me. I'm from California. Uh, there are Christians in California. There's like four, five of them left. It's a pleasure to be here. I love your pastors. I love your whole worship uh, and leadership team. And um, as I pulled into the hotel late last night, I drove from Washington, D.C. I'd been speaking at Values Voter uh, Summit. And as I pulled into the hotel, they welcomed me. They took my credit card information. And the dear two sisters behind the desk said, okay, here, wait, Kufi, Kufi, Christians United for Israel. We love Christians United for Israel. When that happens... You're in Quakertown from California, and you get welcomed like that at a hotel you've never stayed at before in your life. You know you're at the right place at the right time. <laughs> and so thank you, Pastor, so much. We went to Israel together many years ago, and, and we tore it up, and it tore us up. Uh, that was a little bit about Kufi. It's what we've been doing. In the last six months, we've grown by 1.4 million members in the last six months. Now, we're not doing anything 
differently. We work all day long. It's not a job. It's a calling. We're living in a unique period of time. We're not doing anything different, but God is blowing on us and exploding the membership. We need to be 8, 9, 10 million because God holds the hearts of kings and he turns them like a river course, but he uses people to go to the kings. You saw that and maybe you're thinking, oh, Kufi's political? Was Esther going before the king political? Was Moses going before Pharaoh political? Was Daniel, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Ezra, John the Baptist, Apostle Paul, them going before the leaders of their land? Was that political? That was biblical. And that's why we do what we do. Because we are living in the most prophetic time on earth since the angels moved the stone away. And it has to do not with the resurrection of the Jew of Jews. Thank God he was resurrected. We're living at the moment in time of the resurrection of the entire nation of Israel prophesied by God. We are living at it. No one has ever seen it. Let me give you a little of the Word of God. This will be our foundation, okay? You know all these things. You're at a church that preaches the whole Word of God. God was talking to Abram. He made him a promise. It had to do with a piece of land. That promise was forever, which in Hebrew means... Thank you. I love Abram's faith. And I love what happens because of it. He believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Have any of you ever believed something, and God clothed you with righteousness because of what you believed? Of course, this is where we get this. Everything we have comes from what we call the Old Testament, the only Bible the church ever had, the Hebrew Scriptures. All, everything we have is based upon this. It's what we're grafted into. I love Abram's faith. They've been walking together for 10 years at this point. This is not the first time God has given him this promise. He's repeated it 10 years along the way. The next thing out of Abram's mouth, I believe, oh God. Next thing he says is, uh, I sort of believe. <laughs> okay, that's my faith. I'm, I'm just like that. Again, I'm from California. God... Scratch, he doesn't have a head, but he scratches his spirit and says, well, I don't know what I can do. We've been, what, what do you mean you sort of believe? What do you mean you're not sure if I'll keep this promise? I'm talking to you from the sky. I've done lots of miracles for you. What? Okay, God says, you know what, Abram? How about this? I swear to God. I swear to God, I'm going to keep this promise. And those of us who read the New Testament, we know that's exactly what God did. He swore to God. He swore on his own name. He put his reputation on this specific promise, intrinsically linking the goodness, the holiness, the covenantal character of himself to this. I'm a pastor in the inner city. Some of you know that most of my life I still live there. Holla! All that. God put his street cred on this promise. Abram and his wife would often have ideas and Abram said, okay, uh, well, uh, Eliezer, I don't have any kids. Maybe you'll be one of my relatives. That's who's going to get the promise. God says, no, no, no. You and Sarah. You have a baby boy, Abram, I love him. He says, she old. <laughs> we, don't, we don't really do that anymore. I'm, that's the word of God. Come on, that's what he's saying. God says, yeah, don't worry about that. This is how it's going to happen. This promise is so important to God because he's linked the character of his name to it that do you know every single prophet, every major prophet, every minor prophet except Malachi reiterates this? Every single one? Write these down quickly. We don't have time to go through them all. But if you look, you'll, I'm serious. No, every prophet speaks of a people, a promise, a property, and the, and the promise of God to do it. And we're living in the time when it's happening. We are. No one else has seen it for two millennia. And we get to the New Testament and we find that these, these Jewish people, the promise God made them that through the mercies of Christ were grafted into, 
They're beloved to God because of His covenant to them. He's not done with them. Thank God He's not done with the church. He better not be. And these promises that the prophets speak of, they're not vague. They're not Revelation or Daniel where they're un, really unknowable. There's, if they were clear, there'd be at least one view of them that everybody would agree on, right? We do our best to teach and understand. No, these are black letter law. God said, I'm going to do such and such. And they're going to bring them back to their land. I'm going to plant them there. And they will never again be uprooted from the land. That's, as you begin looking for them, that's how the prophets speak. That kind of clarity over and over and over again. It's happening right now. Right now. Do you know that most of Christendom today is anti-Israel? Most. You live in a wonderful community. Pastors preach the whole word of God. Most of Christendom is anti-Israel. Christians United for Israel were the largest pro-Israel organization in the, in the nation. We represent maybe 80 million evangelicals. We've got a lot more to reach. Maybe 80 million is what we're told we have in the nation. There's five guys that do what I do, 200,000 miles a year. I'm at universities. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'll be at University of Delaware two days. I'm at churches. This is what we do. 200,000 miles a year doing this. My 11th year. Five of us. The World Council of Churches represents half a billion Christians. 500 million around the world. They've raised up 1,800 activists in the World Council of Christians, of churches, the WCC. 1,800 of them. They go around doing what we do. And they say everything I've just said and everything you believe is heresy. It's heresy to suggest that God's promise to the Jews is still viable. That's what they teach. It's heresy to suggest that the Jewish people have a right to live in their ancestral land. It's heresy to suggest that it's based on a covenant God made to them. The World Council of Churches, 500 million Christians. It's not even close. You have no idea how rare you are. You don't because we don't know what we don't know. Is that fair? I have to take and start with that because that's the board in our eye, our faith community. If we're going to help work with God and if we're going to help our Jewish friends because they're scared to death right now. And God's looking for an Esther voice. He's looking for a voice that will go before the kings of the land. Now let's take a look at the world outside. First starting inward, let's take a look right now. These are all within the last six months to a year. Here's what's happening with the Jewish people and the state of the world towards them. European Jews, 90%. It's getting close actually to half are thinking of leaving Europe. Christian Europe, no longer safe to be a Jew. Germany, frightening anti-Semitic. It's not safe to be self-identified as a Jew on the streets of Germany. You can't wear your kippah. Don't do it. Not if you're going outside. But beloved, it's not safe on many of our college campuses to wear kippahs in America. That rally is actually a group on our campus. So are you now. nervous on campus now? Yeah, walking around campus, I actually, I'm not going to lie, I do fear for my life. Like, I'm constantly in, like, paranoid, like, watching behind me and stuff. Like, I'm actually afraid to walk by myself sometimes. But this year, I've come back. Um, some of my Orthodox friends, he won't wear a keep anymore. Like, he always wore a keep. And the first thing he said is, like, why do you not have your keep on? Is I'm afraid to walk around with that on. Like, I do not feel comfortable at our school walking with that on. That's why we have Kufi on campus. If you have any college students here, this June, we will pay you to come to Washington, D.C. We will fly you out. We will put you in hotels. You'll meet with six, eight hundred other Christians from college campuses, from little community colleges to Yale University, where Alan Dershowitz is the sponsor of Kufi on campus. Why? We can't find a Christian professor that will sponsor the club. Not money sponsor, just be responsible to turn the lights off and on. On college campuses... If it's hard now, think about our next generation. My, my grandson's starting college right now. If we don't make impact on these students, in 10 years they run the country. In 10 years we will not be a pro-Israel nation. And the day that happens, we begin slipping off into the boneyard of history. One thing we've learned from history is we don't learn from history. And we better. 
France, let's continue really quickly around the world, 74% rise in anti-Semitism. Australia on the rise. Great Britain, oh my gosh, Great Britain, it is so horrific. If it wasn't for the Beatles and fish and chips, I'd just say, get rid of them. I'm serious. I'm so angry with Great Britain. Canada. United States of America. Highest level in 20 years right now. Dozens and dozens of these every week. I stopped it before it gets violent, more so. He was recognized as a Jew on the streets of New York. Every single week this is happening. It's all so reminiscent to the Jews. The power of life and death is in the tongue, words. And the signpost to Auschwitz, the signpost to the Holocaust, started with words. And those words were, it's all the fault of the Jews, and we're there right now. And one generation ago, during the Holocaust, they didn't have Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, but they had, social, they had media, and the Nazi propaganda machine would turn these out by the thousands and publish them all around the world. The Jews started the war. Jews make wars longer. Jews start wars, thousands of these. Jews are destroying the world over and over and over again. This one, however, is from 2016, beloved. It's 1939 again. And this was a time when the church in Europe was Nazified and the church in America was silent. We're getting a do-over. We are. We hope you join Kufi before you leave today. We're not looking for donors, and that's not a trick to get donors. It truly isn't. We're looking for members. We need to be 8 million, 9 million, 10 million. Because Capitol Hill, they love us. Now they're starting to love and fear us. And that's what they need to do. Because this is our country. And this is a critical, critical time and moment in time. And the, the, it, we can't call it crazy anymore. It's beyond crazy. It's, it's psychotic global Jew hatred. The same as it was a generation ago. Because what the Jews are being told over and over again is it's all their fault. What's all their fault? Everything. Terrorism. Hatred. The reason we're hated is because we stand with them. And they're being told that it's all their fault. Can you even see Israel on the map? It's that little green spot. It's a scale map. What they're being told is the whole world hates them. All of the terrorism, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is their fault because they need to give back all that land they've stolen and now occupied. That's what they're being told. You know it is. How do they wake up every morning, my Jewish friends? I don't know. I have such admiration for them. As they continue to be a light to the world, this is how they're being treated. And you ask, when, when, how? People say, Where, why? Where's this hatred come from? When did it start? When did it start? You know when it started. It started in the womb of Egypt. The children of Israel are being formed as a nation, correct? A 430-year gestation period in the womb of Egypt. That's how long God took in forming them as a slave child. What did the Pharaoh say? Kind of the same laws as they have in New York now as far as abortion. He said, if that baby comes out and you don't want it, actually, if that baby comes out and it's a Hebrew baby, kill it. Throw it into the Nile River. That's what the Pharaoh said. Had he had his way, we wouldn't be sitting here today. There'd be no Jews. There'd be no Jesus. There'd be no redemption for us. And by the way, those Nile crocodiles, they're still there. That's a Nile crocodile. That's where Moses' mother took him in a basket because she knew what would be happening if he got found out. A little Hebrew boy had been born. She takes him. She places him in the Nile reeds. And she walks away, the Bible says. She doesn't turn back. She can't bear to see what's going to happen to him. Because babies were being killed as soon as they came out of the womb. 
until God found people, because He always works with people. He always does. We must pray, I agree. And then we must act. One without the other can be meaningless. And I love my sisters. I esteem you all higher than myself. You made us. Thank you for our belly buttons. Thank you for feeding us. All that that women have passed on to us. But in the Word of God, God's always using you to save mankind. And God found two women, did He not? Shifra and Pua. It's in your Bibles. Reread it if you're not familiar. He found two Gentile women. They were the midwives of this slave nation being raised up. And they talked to other midwives. They said, oh, we're not going to kill those babies. No, we're not. Do you know they would have been thrown into the Nile? That's what would have, they didn't care. They didn't care the cost. Why? They feared God. What God? The God of the Hebrew people. And a blessing chased after them. Because those that bless them, those that bless them will be blessed. You know the stories, they, the exodus, they get out of the promised land, they come, uh, they get to the promised land. Has not been a good journey. It's been a short one, not a good one. And God says, well, I think every parent at some point, we're generally teasing. We'll go, I'm going to kill that kid. We're we're really not going to kill you. Usually we're joking. God wasn't. You know the story. He says to Moses, I'm going to, I'm going, to, I'm going to destroy them all and start all over with you. Moses said, no, 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 God, you can't. You cannot do that. If you destroy all these people, leaving none alive, the Goyim, the Gentiles, the nations who've heard of your fame, they're going to say, well, the Lord was unable to do what he promised. He was unable. He's a feckless God. He's an impotent God. He's a, guy who, he's a God who lies And he couldn't do it, so he got rid of the evidence. God, you can't do this. You have to understand you've intrinsically linked the holiness of your name to a people, a promise, a property. It's your street cred, God. You can't do it. You've got to fulfill your promises. He brings them back 40 years later. Joshua and Caleb, they finally are going to make it into the land, right? Joshua says, I got good news, I got bad news. Good news, ladies, we're going in. Put away your boxes. We're not moving anymore. 18 times or so they moved during those 40 years. Oi. You know what moving's like. I got bad news, though. Everybody there, and I mean everybody there, wants to kill you and your children and me. Everybody. But this is how we know the Lord God is with us. He's going to drive out our enemies. And that unbeknownst to Joshua, would be a prophetic statement because to this day, oh, it's no longer the Hivites up in the top. That's Hezbollah now. They have 200,000 missiles because somebody thought it was a good idea to give Iran access to $150 billion not too long ago. And so all the enemies of Israel now are well equipped. 200,000 missiles. Hezbollah, not the Hivites. All pointing down at Israel, they're waiting for the moment that Iran says now. A thousand missiles a day will come into Israel. No longer is it the Philistines over in Gaza. Where the Philistines come from. It's now Hamas attacking daily. And I could go on and on. with Persia, Iran. The enemies of Israel will be driven out because God said so. We get to the New Testament. The Jews have been living in the land. They have a beautiful temple. Uh, Herod the Great helped build it. Herod the Great was crazy. No, I mean crazy. He killed his favorite wife. That's what history, his favorite wife. I know what he did with the one he didn't like. He killed two of his sons. He was a little paranoid. But God used him to rebuild the temple, the footprint of Jerusalem. Jerusalem we saw much bigger than it was in the Old Testament time. God uses crazy leaders to help Israel. And I'm just going to leave that right there. Nebuchadnezzar, right? Cyrus, and on and on and on. Pray for your leaders. Pray for our leaders. God uses them. And if this nation continues to stand with Israel, we'll make it through the storm. If we allow our nation to turn against them, we'll slip into the boneyard of history. We will. Every, ne- every single civilization, civilization does. Every single nation does. Well, quickly, I'm almost to the place I can finish up with my scripture on top of this. 
History records, as Jesus prophesied, the temple will be destroyed, every stone torn down upon another. Remember that? And in 70 AD, Rome came in. They'd had it with the Jews. Jerusalem was destroyed. A million Jews dead in the streets of Jerusalem, according to Josephus, the the historian. And the Jews were cast out into all the lands. And there they remained for almost 2,000 years. Ezra sums this time up perfectly, but he's talking about it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before it ever happens. That's what prophets do. And every prophet except Malachi talks about this day. Every single prophet. The problem in the church is that people are taught not just to highlight verses or to underline. Too many churches are taught. When you get to the word Israel, take out white out. White it out and write in the church. No, God has promises to us, and he says so. And when he says Israel, he means the children of Israel. We're grafted into them. We're grafted into the promise, but we're still Gentiles, and the New Testament makes that clear. It's another another message. What's happening right now is pivotal. It's the center of God's heart on the earth, and I'll show you why. Ezekiel sums it up. People of Israel living in their land. This is when Jesus was there and he prophesied, God's going to destroy the temple because you've defiled the land, and I'm going to chasten you, I'm going to cast you out amongst all the countries. Whenever the children of Israel were, were, were sent out of Israel, they were in a time of chastening. Anytime God would bring them back, and it's happened before, they were in a time of favor. The Jews are back in the land. God's working. It's a time of favor for the Jews. And all the nations of the world stand against it. And most of Christendom calls it heresy. That's where we're at today. God says, I had concern now for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. He casts them out, and now his name's being profaned. Profane. To defile something that's holy because you have disdain for it. That's what profane means. To defile something holy with disdain. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned amongst the nations where they went. In the past... If Israel crossed that line and it was affecting the name of God, he let them know so they'd stop. You can't offer children to Molech. You can't set your slaves free and then make them slaves again. When you do that, you profane my name. It affects me, God says. And I'm a holy God. You've got to stop that. He's always made it clear, not this time. I've studied this for 30 years. And it wasn't until... November 2017, I saw what I'm about to show you. Because he brings this up over and over again, had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned amongst the nations. Thus says the Lord God, not for my sake. I'm going to act for my holy name's sake, which you've profaned amongst the nations where you went. I'm going to vindicate, sanctify, protect the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned amongst the nations, which you have profaned. He's still not done. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my name. It always felt like God took his belt off and was just whooping the child two, three, four, five times he says this to them. And he never tells them what they're doing in my study of it. How do they change God? How do they repent? How do they turn around? And he never tells them, or so I thought. And one day, November 2017, I'm reading, and Ezekiel 36, verse 20, zoom, kind of rises up in front of my eyes, and I apparently saw it for the first time. I said, hello, darling, where have you been? Just as some of the Jewish leaders in the, in the Sadducees, Pharisees, Sanhedrin, the scribes, some of them didn't recognize Christ when he came because they weren't looking for that kind of Savior. They're looking for somebody to save them from the Gentiles, which God will do someday. Save them from Rome. Reestablish Israel. 
That's not what Jesus came to do the first time. So they missed him. I was looking for the wrong thing. I was looking for what are the Jews doing that was profaning God's name? Was it adultery? Was it, a, was it a idolatry? Was it bloodshed? They weren't doing anything. But wait, his name was being profaned. It was. So much so that God arises to confront it for the sake of his name. Because when they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name. How? Nothing they were doing. His name was being profaned because it was being said of the Jewish people. What was something being said about the Jews in exile? That's what profaned your name? Mm -hmm. What could possibly be said? This. These are the people of the Lord, but they're not living in the land. What a feckless God. I thought he promised y'all. I thought he was a God who was gracious and a promise keeper. Looks like you got on his bad side, didn't you? Looks like he's a man that changes his mind. Same thing Moses told him. Have you ever seen that? These are the people of God, but they're not living in the land he gave them. Ooh, God had enough of it. He said, okay, this, time, this is it. It's not for your sake, house of Israel, but for my name's sake I'm going to act. I'm going to take you from the nations, gather you from the lands. I'm going to bring you back into your own land. That's May 14, 1948. Our time. Why? So the Gentiles will know. This is God's last big showing to the world. So the Gentiles will know. They'll have no excuse. I'm going to do something that is so miraculous and the nations will know when I bring you back to your land. I'm going to take you from the nations. I'm going to gather you from the lands. I'll bring you to your own land. I'll have Christian, usually it's teachers and pastors who in a smaller group will raise their hand and say, Pastor, look, I, I don't believe what you're saying here. I don't believe God has to keep his promise to the Jews. The New Testament overrules all of this. I said, well, you, you can believe that. You, you're right to be wrong. But some of this is compelling. Maybe, maybe one day God will raise up a nation of Israel. It surely isn't today's nation of Israel, Pastor. Don't you see how they laud their gay parades, their pro, uh, their, their pro uh, abortion, exactly, is what they are. And the, I said, no, they got every problem we, we've got. They're, they're a pluralistic democracy. I'm not suggesting they're the magic Jews. Yes, they're a secular nation. But why do you fight against the prophets, I'll say, to these who challenge me at this point? What do you mean? The Jews, the nation of Israel today, is exactly the nation of Israel God said he would form. Because he says, I'll take you from the nations. I'll gather you from your lands. I'll bring you into your own land. And then I'll sprinkle you with water. I'm going to get you home first. Come on home, babies, north, south, east, west. Time to come home, just the way you are. Come on, come on, come on. And he empties all the nations where they've been. I'm going to bring you home. Get you home for a while. Then, then I'm going to do this. It's the same way you invite people to church. I can't come to church with you. Oh, no, you can't. No, no, no. You don't understand. I'm a sinner. Oh, you're going to love, you're going to love our church. I don't know. No, it's all sinners. No matter where you sit, balcony, up front, left, right side, it's all, just come sit with us. That's where we get this. That's the nation of Israel. They've only been there 70 years. And the prophets make clear they will be gathered in disbelief. They've been tore up. I don't blame them. May 14th. May 13th, 1948, there's no nation of Israel. May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel is born in a day. You go, wait, how can that happen? Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you, Isaiah. Every prophet talks about it. The Jews danced in the streets. They were given a horrible piece of land. UN Resolution 181, they didn't care. Horrible piece of land. They danced. The, Arab, the Arabs were given a 22nd state. And by dawn the next morning, they came out. They weren't dancing. They came out marching. And they came out to destroy the nation of Israel as they've tried to do over and over and over again. Israel never should have won that battle. You read any of these. And the battles continue today. And God continues to do what he promised he would do. 
And you read any of these, you study any of these wars against the Jewish people today, and they read just like Old Testament battles. The Jews should not win. And thank God with our help, they stay strong. We must keep America standing with Israel. We must reach our college students. That's what we do. I'm here today to ask you to join us because in every battle, in every war, and we are watching the cosmic war of wars, this is the wrap-up. This is what God has placed the holiness of His name on. I swear to God, he said, I'm going to do this. And they'll never be uprooted again. That's why every news report you hear about the Jews, bad Jews, wicked Jews, making Palestinians suffer Jews. Palestinians suffer under Palestinian leadership. Jews don't rule the Palestinians in the Middle East. Only four types of people in any battle. I know I'm amongst protectors and we want to teach you what you can actually do with your faith. So when you say we stand with Israel and we're not asking for money, we'll, we'll teach you. Once you become a member, we can send you, you'll get a, an email or two from us a month and we'll help you add action to your faith. Hey, raise your hand. This is a Bible-believing church. I'm wrapping up now. You recognize any of these names? Anybody? Okay, we got one guy. Let me help out the rest of you. Thank you, sir. Uh, they're all mentioned in the Scripture. In the same two sentences, anybody? <laughs> Hands. Well, yeah. There's 12 of them. We call them the 12 spies. How come you forgot 10 of them? No, I did too. Why? They were called at a time when God was doing something with a people, a promise, and a property. All he needed them to do was to stand with God with what he was doing and encourage the others. That's all he needed. And everything would have changed. Only two did so. This is, a, this is a Joshua Caleb church. This is how rare you are. In our faith community, it's the ten. This is you. When you came in today, you were given a beautiful little packet with the Why Israel booklet we've worked on for years. I hope you take it with you. You should have gotten this. Would you open your packet right now and look? If you don't have this card, if you didn't get this card... Uh, because I need you to fill it out. Write your email legibly, gentlemen. Just have the sister next to you write it, maybe. Be the best way. Write this out. Leave it on your seat or bring it to me. I'll be in the lobby. Please, please, please become a member. Help us reach the 8 million, 9 million, 10 million. We'll train you how to become active with your faith to stand with Israel. If you didn't get a card, raise your hand if you need one. Just raise your hand if you need one. Or come and see me at the table. We got somebody over here who didn't get a card. If we can help them out. Fill that out. Bring it to me. I want to end with this. This is a word to you from our Jewish friends. And they need a friend. We have thousands of these. Literally thousands. Would you read this? This is what this action means to the Jewish people from where we get our Jewish Messiah. And as it's done to the least of them, so we've done to him. Let's stand together this morning, if you would.